or, or because you could either go last in the next one, because I'm also double booked in the next one. So either Sam could go or you could go. Let's just keep going, have Sam. Right. Josh, am I next on this? Yeah, so now Ben is presenting on energy. And do you have the drive, or did you put it on the computer already? I think it's on the computer already. Oh, it's storing now. I see. Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, I'm going to talk about energy and ecological economics. It's not actually part of my PhD research. It's kind of of my pre-doc somehow. It, after my undergrad, I ended up kind of doing a postdoc's job. It was a lot about energy, uh, and so I do. It's a very fascinating topic, and it's very important to ecological economics. We're going to talk about these things right here. Uh, and so Josh got into a, a, a lot, but maybe didn't talk so much about his assumptions. Um, and I think it's like really important to talk, to be explicit about assumptions. And I think this is a huge assumption of ecological economics um, right here. And that if you get in an argument with somebody who says, "Oh, we can count on the red planet," then then maybe you're just at you're at loggerheads, and you have to talk about that and not about economics, right? And so. Wes Jackson is one of my favorite thinkers. I do a lot of my research in agroecology, and he says that man has never been to the moon, not because he's a conspiracy theorist that thinks that Stanley Kubrick you know, filmed the moon landing or anything, but because all the Apollo project did is spend, you know, take all this amazing technology, smartest people in the world, got them together, billions of dollars in today's terms so that a couple people could exist next to the moon and feel its gravity for a couple hours while encased in a little bit of beer. And that and that's really, really true to me. Um, and then and this is another way way of thinking about that. So this is uh, something that Dave Murphy, who's a physics at uh, university physicist at University of California, San Diego, he shows his students a lot. He asks uh, undergraduates, and you could ask actually anybody under the age of 45 this question, uh, how long, how far from the Earth have, do you think people have gone during their lifetime? And so that's low Earth orbit. That's geosynchronous, I believe. That's a little bit further. That's the moon over there, and that's farther than the moon. Most people will say like C, D, or E. Uh, the answer is A. Uh, it's an enormous part of the US NASA budget. It's billions of dollars a year. Uh, one in 25 people who've gone that far have died. Uh, and that's as far as it's been in 45 years. Here's uh, Mars on the other is That's the diagram before. Over there, uh, none of that space in between is habitable. So you know, may maybe we do get there, but I don't think that there's really a conversation to have about economics in a world where it's possible for people to live on Mars. I think it's a you know, technology solves everything in your post scarcity, so we don't even need economics then. So if we need economics, I think we need an ecological economics. So what does that have to do with energy? Well, on Earth, energy gives us limit. Uh, limits, so there's source limitations. There's a finite amount of solar energy. It's a lot that comes into the Earth, but it is finite. Um, we can't really increase it. I mean, we can increase the Earth's radiation budget, but we probably shouldn't. We are doing it. Um, and there's finite stocks of fossil fuels. And there are also sink limitations, so greenhouse gas emissions, as uh, Dr. Matthews talked about, and also heat dissipation. So if, even if we converted to 100% renewable energy, all energy, once it's used, dissipates as heat. At the current rates of energy system growth, you're running into very hot temperatures in the next couple hundred years simply from the heat coming off of the machines, which is several orders of magnitude less than the heat created by carbon dioxide um, from, the, uh, from a fossil fuel making the same energy. Um, and there's been a shift in focus a lot in ecological economics in the last 10 years or so. From peak oil, a lot of people, there was a lot of overlap um, in ecological and economics. A lot of people who um, were looking at trends in oil and, and had the feeling that oil was going to run out soon. Uh, and it's much more now on the climate change side, side. So because of things like hydraulic fracturing and tar sands, we now uh, can definitely produce enough oil for the next couple decades, uh, which is enough to fry ourselves. And then we might run out of oil. Um, but that these, these sink limitations, where does the, gap, the uh, carbon go, is much more important uh, these days than, than it would have been in the field 20 years ago. And this is also important because the economy is fundamentally metabolic, and that gets to a, 
what a lot of what Josh was talking about. It's transforming thing one thing to another. Even server farms, you know, the knowledge economy, the post material economy is made up of <laughs> enormous server farms that use incredible amounts of energy and. Uh, and computers take energy to build and take uh, energy to mine the resources for them and agriculture and everything else we're doing. And so that's just what the economy is. You take things in nature, you turn it into stuff, and then it turns into waste on the other side. And that's, once again, how ecological economics thinks about the economy. And over time, there's a long-term relationship between global GDP and global energy consumption. The, because this curves upwards, it shows that GDP is not quite uh, you say, people would say relative decoupling from energy use. So the growth of energy use is slower than the growth of GDP in recent years, but it's still a very strong uh, relationship. And it's, except for the last couple of years, energy use growth and GDP growth has almost always been very tightly coupled. So the next idea is around is net energy, which is the really the foundation of all sorts of complex adaptive systems, whether they're ecosystems or, or human systems or coupled human natural systems. Uh, so if you think about, about a tree, a tree has an energy producing organ, right, which is the leaves, and it puts energy into that system and it gets energy back and it uses that energy uh, to build a root system, to run that root system, to feed, it might have mycorrhizal fungi that it works with it and needs to give energy to. The fungi might help it find uh, phosphorus or help it deal with disease. It also has to produce seeds. Put a lot of energy into seeds to fund the next generation. Um, and, and all of that comes down to the leaves producing more energy than they take it, uh, than they use. Think about a, a human um, system. Uh, so this is uh, the Kalahari San of uh, Southern Africa. Uh, they mostly live on Mongongo nuts. Um, they also hunt, but they, they forage a lot. Uh, and they work about 20 hours a week, uh, according to most of the anthropological research, and a lot of them don't work at all. Um, which means uh, if, if there are 164 hours in a week and people are only spending 20 hours a week foraging for food, it means that the amount of energy that they're putting into gathering their food is a lot smaller than the amount of energy that they're getting out. Um, and it also the extra energy goes to you know children who, in addition to them doing things other than working, right here, right? They like to play music and, and dance and socialize and visit each other, all the things that everybody else likes to do, right? And they also have you know children and the elderly or people for who for other reasons can't work, and their relatively leisurely hunter-gatherer lifestyle or gatherer-hunter, I should say, because two thirds of their calories come from nuts, uh, yields um, they're getting 20 calories of nuts sometimes for every calorie they're spending looking for it. And that's what allows them to live a lifestyle that a lot of modern humans say, that, that seems okay, like I could do that. Then you think about pre-modern agricultural societies, think about the structure of feudalism. You have the organ of that society that's producing food, the, the peasantry, uh, putting a lot of energy, a lot of drudgery into producing food. And most of that, going back to most of what's yielding has to go back into supporting those, uh, those families and a little bit going off into the knighthood and the, you know, the military and the church. Um, but the size of those surpluses was, was very small and so you had a lot of peasants and, a very, few, and very few knights. Are you saying I, I, I don't know? Like okay, I, so I was really surprised. I didn't that not, sorry. Okay, <laughs> thanks Josh. Um, and then what you see in modernity is you have fossil fuels rapidly increasing the productivity of labor and capital. So um, American Farm Bureau likes to brag their current numbers, say 155 people fed by each farmer, which means that a lot less people are farming right now, which you have people going into industry, then you use more en energy in industry by roboticizing it, and that frees up, frees up more people to work in the knowledge economy and uh, be like we are, I guess. Um, and so this gets to a really, really important concept that some people call the fourth law of thermodynamics. Uh, it comes, uh, originally comes from uh, Watka, the uh, uh, ecologist, um, more fleshed out by uh, Howard Odom, Howard T. Odom. Uh, and basically the idea being that self-organized systems organize around maximum rate of power flow, not around efficiency. So the thing about, uh, all, uh, nearly all systems, all systems observed that 
uh, generate power, uh, tend to generate power at medium levels of efficiency. Um, or, and so an example of that would be with a car engine, at very low RPMs, your car is very efficient, but you can't generate very much power. At very high RPMs, your car is, also, is very inefficient. You can't generate very much power because you're just generating a lot of heat and you're gonna overheat your engine. It's at the mid-range that you get the, the highest range of, uh, you get maximum power, but it's at a lower efficiency than maximum. And so if you go back to all those systems, in a lot of cases, it's the, what's being maximized is not the efficiency, it's the rate of power throughput. So a great example of this is if hunter-gatherers were so much more efficient than uh, agricultural peoples, which our evidence suggests they were, why were the more efficient systems displaced by the less efficient ones? Well, the less efficient ones had much greater throughput of energy. They were able to support less people at a lower energy return. And so despite being less efficient, there were more of them and they were able to, uh, in most cases, kill off or you know, enslave, so uh, dispossess those people. And this actually, this is the same, kind of the same idea as um, the when to stop rule in microeconomics, that systems will kind of continue optimizing until any more output of energy is actually reducing their output of energy. And so this also gets to the, the really important concept of energy efficiency. Some people think it will save us, but you have two real problems with this one is the Jevons paradox. So in the UK um, and around the world, lighting has gotten a lot more efficient. We no longer have to take things that if you touch them, they would burn us, uh, which is a lot of waste heat um, to light our houses. But people use more energy on lighting, not less. And um, there was a period of time when cars, in terms of their engines and their aerodynamics, were getting a lot more efficient, uh, 1984 to 2001, because just cars got bigger and drove more miles. So the cars getting bigger canceled out all the extra efficiency, and then they drove 30% more miles. Um, and all processes have theoretical maximum efficiency. So light is a photon, There's a, and a photon is energy. And you can be 100% efficient at that, and we're, um, at current technologies, you know, almost halfway there compared to the 5,000% improvement from Edison to an LED. Electric cars, uh, their mo motors are 90% efficient and they also, uh, most of the remaining efficiencies are in aerodynamics. You could make a car that's shaped like a trout and you could get like triple the uh, energy efficiency of an electric car, but people don't want to be in a fish car. <laughs> um, and this is actually explained by the maximum empower principle because if you, you can do more with more uh, and, that, and that's selected for in these uh, evolutionary systems. So now getting to what ecological economics is kind of doing with the concept of energy. Um, it's the link between energy and sustainability and there are different goals and you need different frameworks and different ways to think about energy uh, for each of them. So I talked a bit about the energy return, so EROI is really um, important in ecological economics. Uh, it's the ratio of energy out, energy in, um, and it, it tends to be a, a metric of the quality of a resource or its harvest efficiency. Uh, this comes from uh, Murphy and Hall, uh, who are two more biophysical economists. That's a, uh, uh, a little bit of a Nicene split, you might say, in, uh, in heterodox, ecologically minded economics. That's inside, but you can see that uh, historically net energy uh, was extremely high uh, in oil and gas. Energy returns often over 50 to 1. Temperate biofuel, which has, was really active in ecological economics in the early 2000s, doing energy analyses of those. Uh, most of the energy from those systems having to go back into those systems to produce more energy. Um, so that, that now, once again, I'm stealing from Wes Jackson here. Um, living off of solar income is a port, important part of sustainability. Uh, and so Wes Jackson talks about five pool, pools of carbon, that we are degrading accumulated carbon in soils and accumulated carbon in forests far before people figured out how to really use a lot of coal, oil, and natural gas. And, and if you're thinking about it from this perspective, you actually might want to think about energy a little bit differently. So this is data from a long-term um, agroecological trial or um, as in studying the ecology of 
agricultural systems uh, in Wisconsin. This is a continuous core and conventional system that, because they're doing a really good job on it, is having you know seven units of corn out for uh, energy out for every one energy a unit of energy put in, which is not typical. Uh, it's, it, it seems like a really highly efficient system. And if you did this with bioethanol, you might say, oh wow, we're producing uh, a lot of energy, we can feed our cars with it, and that's great. Uh, this is where you add in uh, the soil carbon that was oxidized. Because soil carbon, that's, that's energy, right? You can take, you can, I mean, there are power plants in Ireland that burn peat. Soil organic matter is hydrocarbons. And so in this case, um, so from societal metabolism and producing that energy for people to use, this system looks great, has a great energy return. From the per perspective of sustainability, it has a terrible energy return. From the perspective of climate change, it has a terrible energy return. Now, another one of the issues is just the way that energy makes us profligate. Um, the way that we waste it or use it inefficiently and how we have to move towards entropic thrift. So, anybody want to push a car for five cents a mile? Because that's what gas does for us. Uh, you're actually way more efficient because the wind. There's very little wind resistance at the speeds that you're going to push it. So you're probably several, like an order of magnitude, more efficient than gasoline in doing it. There are very few people in the world who are poor enough to push a car a mile for five cents. Uh, this is another one of the, from a comic on uh, the concept of energy slaves, which Buck, uh, Buck, Mr. Fuller came up with. Um, envisioning what it would look like for the. This is the human energy equivalence to push an airplane and how you can kind of see that everywhere in our energy uh, profligacy. And also the way that it makes, in a lot of cases, like our cities and our landscapes really hard to live in. I'm an avid cyclist and I noticed that a lot. And then within this, it's really important to know that all energy sources have some consequences. There are huge debates around like where wind turbines should be siting, uh, sited, where solar should be sited, high voltage trans transmission lines, uh, there are better forms of harvesting energy, but renewable doesn't mean without consequences. And that means that we need to be not just efficient, but thrifty with energy. And then the last one is just, uh, people should talk to Matt Burke about this, because he um, is thinking a lot about that. I know he's presenting here uh, today, my colleague. But um, economic systems really tie into energy uh, transitions. So there's a lot of work on the low, low efficiency systems, um, are, can maximize power in high resource gradients. Uh, so laissez-faire capitalism has done a really good job of maximizing power for itself, right? I think everyone, you know, from like Marx to, you know, to Friedman can agree on that, right? That it, it maximized power for itself. Um, but it's slow growing, stable, highly organized systems are associated with these uh, shallower resource gradients that we might see from renewable energy. And then also, maybe we're having, gonna have to think about different ways of thinking about private property um, and public goods because of the difference between uh, how renewable resources work versus uh, the fossil energy resources work. So that's a summary. That's. Uh, sort of a quick survey of energy and ecological economics. And thanks so much.